In this lecture, I will look at the introductory issues and resources for studying Matthew's Gospel. This is a very brief lecture that could go on much longer, but my main purpose is to say a few things about some of these topics and then defer to some of the reading for this course. Firstly, I'd like to make a couple comments about authorship. Of course, we refer to this gospel as the gospel of Matthew, the disciple of Jesus. And I think two things need to be said about this. First of all is a comment by Martin Hengel in his studies in the Gospel of Mark. Hengel said that the Gospels did not circulate without titles. Now think about it for a second. Let's suppose that the first Gospel did circulate without a title. Then when you had a second Gospel, you would have to have a way of differentiating the two. And so uh, the best way to do that then would be to refer to them as the author so-and-so and that author's gospel. If Mark is written first, we see that there isn't someone's intention of trying to uh, give status to that gospel by uh, claiming that it was written by an apostle. Uh, so when we come to the gospel of Matthew, some kind of precedent has already been set that it's the author that would be referred to and not some ulterior attempt at trying to give status to what was written. Now, this kind of reasoning is an airtight, but it does suggest that uh, when, we ref when, when the early church refers to the Gospel of Matthew as written by Matthew, there's good reason to believe uh, with, without any counter evidence that it indeed it was written by Matthew. The second comment I'd like to make is with reference to a book by Richard Baucom, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses. In this book, he makes the argument that whoever wrote the four Gospels, uh, they all attest to uh, eyewitness testimony. Now, in Mark's case, that is that Mark is writing down what Peter, the apostle, was testifying. And so he argues that this is also, th th that idea is indicated by Papias in the early part of the second century, but it is also something that might be uh, uh, testified to in the book itself, in that uh, Peter is mentioned at the beginning and the end of the book. And so you get the idea that Peter can testify to what is from the beginning and up until the end of the book of Mark. So that's Bauckham's argument that you do find some indication of sources in the uh, Gospels. Uh, as to Luke, we have a number of persons mentioned who could give eyewitness testimony. And some are the testimony of women at certain points, like Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Susanna. But then again, we also have Simon Peter uh, mentioned toward the beginning of Luke and at the end, and in the beginning of Acts, and then at the end of the material on Peter in the book of Acts. Bauckham does argue that John's gospel was written by someone named John, a beloved disciple, but not the disciple uh, that is known as John, the son of Zebedee. And he argues that this John was actually from the uh, high priestly household uh, and had special access to the passion um, of, of Jesus at the end of, of the gospel. He again, though, is an eyewitness if not the son of Zebedee. And then uh, we have the statement in Matthew's gospel that um, Matthew was called by Jesus uh, from being a tax collector, that special statement in Matthew's gospel. And that might be an indication of the author of his connection to uh, the stories to which he can give eyewitness testimony. That does raise the question as to why a disciple like Matthew would have used a book like Mark. Uh, 
for much of his uh, writing. Why would he use a resource like that if he himself was a disciple? And I think the answer to that is that Mark is the uh, is not an independent author, but is reporting what Peter said. And secondly, uh, perhaps various people in the church are already quite aware of and have approved of Mark's gospel. And Matthew is, has no intention of undermining that, but rather affirming it. And so I think that would answer that question. Scholarship on Matthew's gospel has often pointed out to a Jewish provenance for this gospel. That is to say that it seems to have been written for a Jewish audience, of, whether in Israel or in that general region, such as the church in Antioch in Syria, uh, somewhere in that region, as opposed, for example, to John's gospel being written in Ephesus. The gospel shows a number of Jewish features, and if you want to explore this in depth, I think one source that's very good at this is the commentary by W.D. Davies and Dale Allison in the introduction. Now, some of the arguments uh, regarding this uh, Jewish context are as follows. The, the text of Matthew's gospel, there are, as we can note uh, throughout the course, numerous references to the Old Testament. Also, while Matthew 9's raising of the 12-year-old girl from the dead does not use the Aramaic that you find in Mark 5.41, and that's possibly just because Matthew's shortening Mark, as he typically does, uh, Matthew does use Aramaic targums on occasion for the Old Testament quotations. And that's pointed out, for example, by Robert Gundry, um, and also the commentary of Craig Evans on a number of occasions. Now, the issue here may be that um, Matthew is just shortening Mark's gospel, but is at other times showing an intentional use of Aramaic. So just because we don't find um, a repetition of an Aramaic phrase does not mean that we can argue against the Jewish provenance for this gospel. Further on, uh, there seem to be some interesting passages to argue for a Jewish provenance. Compare Mark 7.19 to Matthew 15.17. Mark has a parenthetical phrase in the pericope where Jesus is interacting with his disciples and the Pharisees about hand washing. And Jesus takes the opportunity to point out that what defiles a person is not something external, but the heart. And so we pick up in verse 19 with the this uh, sentence here in the, the first box. Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach and is expelled, asks Jesus, and then Mark inserts a parenthetical remark. Thus he, Jesus, declared all foods clean. Now, Matthew uses Mark's gospel, and so it is surprising that um, he doesn't include Mark's parenthetical remark. Do you not see that whatever goes out into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? Now, this verse is important for discussing Matthew's understanding of Jesus in the Old Testament law. But just in terms of provenance here, it you could argue that he doesn't want to make the statement or the interpretation that all foods are clean in a context where everyone continued to practice uh, kosher food laws. That's That's at least the argument that's presented. Another argument is that Matthew eliminates from Mark the possibility of women divorcing their husbands and the discussion of divorce in Mark 10 compared to Matthew 19. And uh, we know that the Greco-Roman world did practice divorce uh, for both men and women. Women could divorce their husbands, whereas that does not seem to be the case in the Jewish context, or at least not so much the case. 
Then another example would be the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23 are said by Jesus to sit on Moses' seat. That's a very positive statement about them. And some have argued this is further evidence of the provenance of a more Jewish context. And then there's uh, another point. Experience of the persecution in the synagogues has suggested to some people that the disciples were still in the synagogues. That's in the uh, missionary discourse in chapter 10 and in the chapter that where Jesus pronounces judgment on the scribes and Pharisees in Matthew 23. Now, I would take an alternative view um, than that, and that is that this simply reflects the historical situation dur during Jesus' time. People were still in the synagogues at that time. So I don't think that reflects a later time when there may still be people in the synagogue who are Christians. Nevertheless, that has been one of the arguments pre presented for this position of a Jewish provenance. Another comparison with Matthew and Mark is where Matthew omits from Mark an explanation of the Jewish ritual of cleansing. Now, this is the same passage that's up higher that we looked at in Mark 7 and Mark 15. But there is a long explanation in Mark's gospel regarding uh, the Jewish practice of washing of hands, whereas if you're in a Jewish uh, context, uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't need that explanation for your audience. And then there's also the curious uh, distinction between the phrase kingdom of heaven and kingdom of, of God in the Synoptic Gospels. The reference of kingdom of God is frequent in Mark and Luke, whereas uh, Matthew almost always has kingdom of heaven. And there is a Jewish tendency to avoid using the name God. And so you talk about the throne of God, or you talk about the power, or you talk about a voice from the throne, as we have in Revelation or you talk about heaven. And so that is also another reason why people have suggested a Jewish provenance. The discussion of provenance has been focused at times on the idea of uh, gospels being produced by particular communities for those communities. And one example of that is a book by Christer Stendhal uh, which in, has a republication date of 1991, but was written earlier than that, where he suggested that there was an actual school of uh, disciples that produced the Gospel of Matthew. And one argument for that has to do with the use of the Old Testament in Matthew's Gospel. But the, my main point here is that there's this idea that's, that was around in the 20th century for decades that uh, understood the Gospels as um, having a specific provenance, a specific flavor of the church, for example. Over against that, Richard Baucom argued in 1998, um, along with others contributing to a book he edited, that uh, the Gospels were not written for unique communities with their own theological um, emphases, but were written for all Christians. Bauckham and others argued that the Gospels were not written for isolated communities, but for the church at large, and were testimonies by reliable witnesses, including eyewitnesses. The Gospels are less about the witnesses themselves, a particular community with a particular slant, and more about what it is that they witnessed. And that certainly is consistent with an evangelical uh, perspective on the issue. As we look at the date of Matthew's Gospel, we can say a few things, but I want to caution you against doubling down on um, a fairly popular view that Matthew was written in the mid-80s to mid-90s. 
I don't really know, but I would say that we can say a few things. First of all, I do believe Matthew used Mark's gospel, and there's reasonable argument that he did so in Rome as Peter told him what to write. And so that would locate Mark's gospel in the 60s and then Matthew's gospel sometime after that, any time from the late 60s. Matthew 22, 7 has been a much discussed verse in terms of date. It's interesting that the parable is rendered in Matthew's gospel with reference to a king sending his army to destroy the murderer's city. That's uh, unique to Matthew's gospel, and it does seem that that would, could be related to A.D. 70 when the Romans destroyed Jerusalem and the temple in the war uh, between the Jews and the Romans. Now, that's not knocked down, a not knocked down argument, but it could be that that's an example of Matthean redaction post AD 70 of a parable that Jesus told. Although it's not at all unnatural for Jesus to give an example of a king destroying a city. And so that, uh, that isn't a necessary argument for saying that it, Matthew's written after 70. W. D. Davies, in his book *The Setting of the Sermon on the Mount*, argued for a date in any time from 80, 85 to the 90s, and this is the period during which Pharisees f met together in a town called Jamnia or Yavne in Israel to give definition to Judaism. In the destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem, there was also a destruction of uh, certain forms of Judaism. The Sadducees were priests associated with the temple, and with the destruction of the temple, they ceased to exist. They were the controlling force in Jesus' day um, in Judaism, but now they are discontinued. And the definition of Judaism is no longer around the temple, but around what the Pharisees can de uh, uh, define Judaism as, and that is a religion of the law. The Essenes also come to an end, although they're not mentioned in the Gospels. Now, certain benedictions are associated with the synagogue service that the Council of Jamnia affirms. And w the twelfth benediction states, let the Nazarenes and the Minim, the heretics, perish in a moment. David, Davies understands that to refer to the followers of Jesus of Nazareth who are considered heretics. And if so, then what's happening in this benediction is a, a clarification of Judaism that does not allow Christianity to be um, a, considered a legitimate um, belief system or version of Judaism. So here we have a separation of the church from Israel. We can see in Acts, for example, that Paul goes to the temple. Uh, he takes a vow. There's definitely a, a sense in which Christianity is not totally separated from Judaism, even though there's a lot of conflict. And he can identify himself as a Pharisee and divide him, divide the Sadducees and Pharisees who are asking him to explain himself in the book of Acts. Well, sometime in the first century, this kind of distinction came to be, and Davies points out uh, Jamnia as a possibility. Now, some defend a pre-70 date, and I don't think the evidence that's been noted so far is strong enough to discount this. And so uh, we can mention scholars like uh, John A.T. Robinson or Don Carson or Robert Gundry who have made this argument. In truth, though, there's just insufficient evidence to determine a date. And, of course, what we can say is the most important thing, and that is the gospel is written in the lifetime of Matthew and uh, written by an eyewitness. Certainly that it is a first-century gospel. There are a number of gospels that come into existence over time, in the second century, some uh, are Gnostic Gospels and some are just uh, elaborate, made-up stories like the infancy narratives of Thomas.
And so uh, we also should say that the four canonical Gospels are the four Gospels that are written in the first century. There's a qualitative difference between them and any other kind of work that comes under the name of Gospel, even the orthodox options from the second century. One thing we can say as well is that one of the earliest non-canonical authors seems to attest to knowing the Gospel of Matthew, and that can also contribute to the discussion of date, although um, it simply argues that Matthew would have been written in the first century. Ignatius of Antioch writes some letters on his way to martyrdom in the early part of the second century, and he apparently knows Matthew's gospel from some of the references he gives. Also, another work that is very early in the church, some have dated it to the 90s, some to the early second century. The, the work is called The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, or the Didache. And there we find the reference to the two ways, which sounds very similar to Matthew 7, 13 and following. It also has the Lord's Prayer in a similar version to Matthew 6. So it could be that there's a knowledge of Matthew's gospel, although that's not a definitive argument either. So there's the evidence in the, for um, this discussion of date. The discussion of the purpose of Matthew's gospel relates to redaction criticism, where scholars from the mid 20th century asked the question, what was the purpose of the editor of this particular work? It was a slight shift from an historical backgrounds approach to New Testament scholarship to looking at the gospel writers as authors. And this created a, a two-stage reading of the gospels where a story about Jesus would relate to the purpose of Jesus in his day and then the telling of the story in the gospel would relate to the purpose of the author, Matthew, in writing what he wrote for his context. And this then uh, fed right into the question of the search for the historical Jesus. How do we know that the story is, is written in an accurate representation in Jesus' life versus something that is being applied to some extent uh, by the author, Matthew, uh, for his community. So we get some different views on this distinction between the historical Jesus and the author redacting a text. For example, Reinhold Hummel uh, wrote in 1963 uh, a book in which he argued that Matthew's church was at odds with Pharisees, but had not yet left the synagogue. Uh, the stories that are represented then in Jesus' day are understood to be uh, reflecting the church's situation in Matthew's day. So when Jesus and Peter talk about paying the temple tax in Matthew 17, or when Jesus makes the statement in Matthew 23 that the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, or in Matthew 10 and 23, where Jesus talks about the disciples being persecuted in the synagogues, um, we see, says Hummel, that the gospel of Matthew is for a Jewish Gentile community and calls the Hellenist libertines, those more Greek-speaking Jews, back from a trajectory of rejecting the law, from a lawlessness calling them back. And so Matthew's gospel and, and what is read about Jesus and the law in Matthew's gospel should be understood as calling this group of Christians back, Jewish Christians back, to an abiding by the law. So that's one view. On the other hand, and also from the German context, uh, Georg Strecke said uh, in his book, uh, The Way of Righteousness, that Matthew's community had broken with Judaism already. And so in the text, we read phrases like their scribes and their synagogues. 
Also, Matthew intensifies the polemical references in Mark to the Pharisees. And in Matthew, only Judas uses the title rabbi, whereas Mark had used it of Jesus, and the disciples are not to use the title for themselves. Um, that's references in Matthew 23, 7 through 8. Do not call yourselves teacher. And Matthew is open to a Gentile mission at the end of the gospel. So you, what you see here is people doing redaction criticism, trying to figure out Matthew's purpose by comparing Mark and Matthew and the language that Matthew uses. The purpose of Matthew can be seen in his editing of Mark's gospel. Matthew provides a structure to Mark's gospel that helps the reader understand Jesus and his message. Matthew expands Mark's gospel, particularly with uh, more of what Jesus taught. Matthew wants to interpret Jesus with respect to the Old Testament. Matthew wants to show Jesus in relation to the law, fulfillment, not opposition. And Matthew wants to explain how Jesus relates to Israel and to the Gentiles and how the kingdom of heaven's coming uh, relates to the people of God, Israel, and to the Gentiles. Now, one of the big issues already alluded to is uh, Matthew's use of the Old Testament. And one overarching kind of comment to make is there has been some discussion around quotations that use a formula of this happened to fulfill what was spoken of by this or that prophet. So these are called the fulfillment quotations, and they span the entire gospel, although most are in chapters 1 through 13. They're uniquely Mathean material, um, and you can look at that, for example, in the first two chapters of Matthew, and many come from the prophets. We have these fulfillment quotations in the events of Jesus' birth in chapters 1 and 2, the entry into Galilee in chapter 4, healings in chapter 8, compassion and gentleness in chapter 12, teaching and parables in chapter 13, entry into Jerusalem in chapter 21, and um, a couple in the passion and death of Jesus. So one question people have asked is, is there some collection of fulfillment passages that Matthew used in writing his gospel? A kind of Christer Stendhal question of, was there a school of Matthew that was working on fulfillment um, in Jesus' life uh, of the Old Testament? And on the other hand, there are just all kinds of other quotations and allusions in Matthew's gospel right throughout. And there um, are some of these that come from Mark's gospel, but Matthew's gospel certainly expands Mark greatly in his engagement with the Old Testament. That's one thing to be looking out for throughout the course. The text of Matthew's gospel that we have the Greek uh, reconstruction of what the autograph or original might have read, is stable. We don't have huge textual problems in the Gospel of Matthew. And what's listed here on this slide are some of the places uh, that are interesting about textual differences. But this doesn't change um, what we have overall or change the story or change the narrative or change even one pericope. So it's just uh, something to note and something that could be explored further. Now on this course, I have a resource for you on our Canvas site for the course that you can consult called A Guide to Research and Writing. I hope that's helpful for any kind of research and writing you do on the course. My assumption is that you follow the guidelines of Gordon Fee in his New Testament exegesis book for how to write an exegesis paper. And while so much can be said about research and writing, one other thing to say uh, 
is that you should check the ATLA um, through the library, the American Theological Library Association's electronic search catalog for theological works when constructing your secondary bibliography. Now, an exegesis course should pay attention firstly to uh, the primary text and your interpretation of the primary text, the Greek text of Matthew, in its historical cultural context. And it should not be primarily a discussion of what secondary authors have said about Matthew. You can use them to corroborate your findings, but the exegesis paper should show your own ability to interpret the text. And that's where Gordon Fee's exegesis uh, handbook, New Testament exegesis, is especially helpful. I want to talk a little bit now about some resources for exegetical study. And this uh, just picks out some things that you would find in Gordon Fee's New Testament exegesis, but it also updates it in a couple places. And one thing to say is that we could talk about interpreting Matthew's gospel in terms of establishing the text, analyzing the text, synthesizing the text, and applying the text. And in our course, we're not that interested in the application of the text in contemporary ministry situations and audiences. Although there are resources that try to get at that, and um, you can do that at the end of your exegesis paper in one or two paragraphs, but that's not our main focus. That's where you get some help sometimes from application commentaries. Now, in terms of establishing the text, that refers to textual criticism, lexical studies, and grammatical studies, and I'll make some comments about that. And then the resources for analyzing the text would be to get into the historical background, intertextual study of Matthew, that is his use of the Old Testament, and then also use of Mark, and uh, then literary analyses where you're looking at the narrative of the gospel or, or the nature of a parable and so forth. Now, synthesizing the text would have to do with Mathean theology, and you can get at that through books that are New Testament theologies and their discussion of Matthew, or sometimes a whole book on Mathean theology or some theme in Matthew, like Christology, for example. All of these are resources for you uh, on the course. A couple of the number of Bible dictionaries that are available that I would like to point out are the Anchor Bible Dictionary and then uh, InterVarsity's collection of dictionaries, one of which is called the Dictionary of Jesus in the Gospels. These are very good resources, although somewhat dated now. And then in terms of doing word studies, of course, pay attention to lexicons like uh, Bauer's lexicon, especially for New Testament studies, and then also to uh, word dictionaries. And several are listed here as they are in fee, but one that isn't listed by fee is a more recent one by edited by Moses Silva. And I wanted to point this out because it is the replacement for Colin Brown's New International Dictionary of, the New, of New Testament Theology. And so just be aware of, of this. Um, it's a replacement. It's not just an editing of it, but actually a replacement. Some considerably new material is put into this book, and these volumes, rather, not this book. I would recommend that as, a, as an important work to go to for any kind of word studies. And since it's theological word studies often, that also is getting at some of the theology associated with the word. In terms of grammatical aids, I'd recommend the next step from your introduction textbook uh, in Greek to have a look at Daniel Wallace. Now, there are some other very good advanced Greek grammars but Wallace's book is, is one that I can definitely recommend. Um, there are two versions of it. One is a, just a shortened version of this one, which I've listed here, The Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics. Uh, 
And then also uh, there's a whole series of books that B&H Academic is putting out, which is an, which offers exegetical um, interpretation of the Greek text. It's primarily to be used to help you translate the text and understand the exegetical issues that arise out of the grammar. So it's a, a study of the syntax. And in the case of Matthew's Gospel, it's written by Charles Quarles. Now, a word f about commentaries. When I studied Matthew's Gospel back in the 80s in doctoral studies, I remember being fairly disappointed with the commentaries that we had available to us at that time. Since then, a number of good commentaries have been written. And here are a few in the list. I want to pick out a few. Now, one, the first one I want to pick out is Don Carson's uh, commentary on Matthew's Gospel. It appeared in a volume that included commentaries on the other synoptic Gospels. And um, it is uh, head and shoulders above the others in that particular volume of the Expositor's Bible Commentary. Although it goes back to 1984, it's, it's, it's just as an excellent commentary, and it does engage with some of the uniquely uh, even American evangelical issues of interpreting the text. He doesn't limit himself to that, but sometimes some non-evangelical commentaries don't even pick up a discussion, for example, with dispensationalism. And so Carson can be helpful there. Davies and Allison wrote uh, three volumes of uh, commentary on Matthew's Gospel. The whole series, the International Critical Commentary, is very long-lived. Some commentaries go out of use after a few years. But the ICC commentary is so focused on the Greek text that uh, a lot of what is found there even in the older, 100-year-old versions of, of this ICC commentary, you, you can still find useful. And so there's a lot of detail in that book. I've chosen France. I think it's the best commentary we have. Um, but note that France also has a shorter commentary out in the Tyndall New Testament commentary series. And then Donald Hagner is an evangelical um, has written a two-volume commentary for the Word Biblical Commentary. It's very useful. Craig Keener has written a, another good commentary. Craig Keener is especially known for his knowledge of the primary sources, and that can be a helpful commentary to go to for that purpose. I just note that on this, this slide, Ulrich Lutz is a Catholic, and anything to do with Peter and Matthew's gospel might be of interest in that commentary. But otherwise, it's a very detailed European commentary to take note of. Grant Osborne, longtime teacher at Wheaton, um, published his commentary on Matthew in 2010. And Ben Witherington, like Craig Keener, teaches at Asbury Seminary. And he has a, he has a book out on every book of the New Testament. And so one of his is obviously on Matthew as well. So those are some commentaries um, that might be of interest to you on this course. Here I want to mention another commentary by Craig Evans in particular. I think this is a very helpful commentary. He first wrote a commentary on Mark and then uh, continued his studies by writing a commentary on Matthew. And I think it has some interesting strengths to point out. One is his scholarship, like Keener's, is especially known for his understanding of the historical context and the uh, primary sources at the time. And so it's not surprising that you have good behind-the-text analysis, especially of Jewish and the Greco-Roman sources. And then also interesting in this commentary is his exploration of the possible use of Aramaic, um, the use of Aramaic versions of the Old Testament, the Targumim by Matthew.
Uh, it's also a readable commentary despite all that and is easily usable for preaching. So I, I recommend Evan's commentary. It does have what you might say some weaknesses, but they might be intentional and even strengths if you don't want to get too caught up in behind the text analysis. You're not going to, um, for example, have a lot of engagement with early church commentaries uh, in, the, in this volume. So if you want that, you'll have to go somewhere else. It's not intended for preaching and application. So you're not caught up in a lot of discussion about someone's take on something. And then uh, it is not exhaustive. It's very selective in considering different interpretations or secondary source literature. You don't want to get lost in all the discussion. You want to get some evaluation of what's worth pointing out. And then it considers textual criticism and translation issues only occasionally, not every time that there's an issue. And I, I would say that that's actually a strength in a commentary, not to try to be so exhaustive. There are also some studies on Matthew, and I'll just point out a couple of them. Uh, David Ani has edited a book called The Gospel of Matthew in Current Study, and that takes us up to some of the discussion going on up to 2001. A uh, Catholic scholar, Donald Sr., wrote a book called What Are They Saying About Matthew? The Paulist Press put out a whole series of books called What Are They Saying About? And unfortunately, now they're getting a bit dated. But it's a good synopsis of where scholarship was on various issues in Matthew's gospel. At the time, it's still worth referencing and using. So I hope these are helpful to get you oriented in your study of Matthew's gospel.